like to thank you for allowing me into your homes for this first episode of season mm -hmm. season three of Esoteric Science Roundtable. And I'd like to thank all of the all of you that have uh, taken the time to find me on my new channel, which is Channel 16. Same day, at same time. I uh, will still be here Thursdays at nine, but on Channel 16 as opposed to Channel 10. And the reason that I did that. And I'd like to <clears throat> like to thank my producer Chris for also uh, suggesting that we pull this off as well, and reminding me is so that we can also be broadcast into Cedar Park. And if anybody's in Cedar Park that's checking out the show, uh, we'll be here live every Thursday at nine on Channel 16. And look forward to any of you folks uh, that are in that area that are viewing and uh, are uh, considering viewing to stick around and check us out for a while. There are some other shows as well. Uh, one in particular that I want to mention: uh, Jeff Gutierrez, our partner in crime down here. Uh, is also hosting his show, Therefore I Am, at the same time, which is Tuesdays at 10. But he as well is on Channel 16, and he's made the switch uh, because we all chatted about this, that it might be a good idea to get into Cedar Park. And so uh, that was the reasoning behind that. And so if you'll look for both Therefore I Am and Esoteric Science Roundtable on Channel 16, our old time slots, but... Um, New, new channel, and hopefully we'll be able to broaden our viewing uh, viewership a bit as well. And uh, I took it, took the opportunity to uh, take a look at some of the new series shows that are going to be appearing for the 2003-2004 uh, viewing series here at Access Television. And honestly, there's really not too much that uh, has not already been available to us previously. Uh, one of the more patriot-minded shows, which is uh, 911exposed.com, they've moved to uh, Tuesdays at, excuse me, Wednesdays at eight on Channel 10. And the only unfortunate thing about that is they're in opposition directly to George Humphrey and Common Sense, who's going to be on Channel 16 again, his usual time and day, Wednesdays, Channel 16 uh, at eight o'clock. And so there's going to, you have to make a choice, I guess, or tape one and watch the other in that instance. Uh, let's see. Also, since I was last on, the last time I had a show live, the city council was voting and hearing a citizens speaking and, and ultimately voting on a resolution, a city resolution, that is against the Patriot Act, or at least against some of the more ambiguous or nefarious aspects and potential misuses of the Patriot Act. And we've added our city to a growing and ever-growing list of more, I would feel, more progressive thinking cities and more aware cities, those cities that have a population that is a bit more concerned about these issues and see and, and are just receptive to the potential that could possibly take place as far as abuses and, and things of that nature. And so I'd really like to commend uh, all the people that got involved with this. Uh, certainly I want to give the city council credit. Uh, there were those three that did abstain from the vote, making it a four to zero vote. I don't consider the abstainers really part of the vote, honestly. I mean, they still have made a choice by not choosing to decide. But um, I look at it as a four to, four to zero victory, as far as that's concerned, ultimately, my, the way I'm going to consider it. And so, again, I'd like to thank everybody that took the time and energy to either go down and speak or do some part. And there were a lot of folks, and it was a very nonpartisan effort. A lot of people came together on this from a lot of different backgrounds to make this thing happen. And I was really, really pleased at the well-thought-out uh, comments and the vast, again, the vast diversity from different groups. There was no left and right whatsoever as far as this is concerned. And there were ultimately two people that did speak out against the resolution and in favor of the Patriot Act. And I want to commend those two people for having the courage to give their convictions and speak uh, in, in the very, very minority, but still be allowed to have their positions heard as well. Um, but I think reason did over, you know, win the day ultimately when the vote was in and the resolution against the Patriot Act was ultimately passed on the 25th of September. And I think that's a very wonderful thing. <clears throat> It demonstrates our motivation, it d demonstrates our understanding, and it demonstrates by sending the resolution to Washington, piling up with the other resolutions that are growing, um, they, they show, again, public concern for, the, for what's going on. And that's going to have to give those leaders some pause for cause, uh, some cause for pause, rather, uh, to try to um, determine exactly what they, how to best spin, I guess, or, or shape this opposition to this legislation. And so I wanted to quickly mention that as well and um, consider the, uh, 
the resolution to the Patriot Act and the Patriot Act a bit there. Now, today's discussion is going to be crisis, and there are certain points of crisis that come into the life of every individual that fall more so into the category of a personality crisis, and certainly there can be a crisis in a city, <clears throat> there can be a crisis within a family, uh, within a community, within a nation, uh, on a worldwide scale there can be crisis, and uh, certainly the world war or the so-called war on terror, as far as that being a global, all-encompassing thing. Now we can consider those ideas of crisis when there seems to be some opposition. Two groups, at least, arise in, in opposition to one another, and so there's this rubbing against each other, playing off against each other, and creating some disharmony, some unrest, because there's two forces here working, at least, sometimes more in some instances, <clears throat> Excuse me. And so if, to start with, to consider this from the angle of the personality, the first major crisis any individual experiences is birth. That's the first uh, most definitive one that we can think of that uh, is the beginning, beginning of everything. And that is, again, demonstrating duality. It's demonstrating coming from a more spiritual place, uh, the place of, of the rest of the soul and and things of that nature, and then coming into physical manifestation. And so we see this duality, this spirit uh, coming into matter. And that is the first, again, the first major crisis that an individual would experience in one's lifetime. And certainly uh, many are aware of how traumatic the birth experience can be uh, for the parent in some cases, and certainly for the new child coming into the world. And, you know, this is a whole, well, certainly I consider reincarnation, and I want to factor that in a bit later in the discussion as well. But for this time around, if we want to consider it in those terms, this is a new experience for the individual. And so that is a shock. It's a shock to the system, and it's an initial crisis coming into manifestation for any newborn person or animal. Anything that's coming newborn into incarnation is going to experience that birth shock. And so considering along those terms, building to the family, and as far as a crisis within, within the family, we can see if, for instance, there's a, a baby born that has, for instance, a birth defect or something of that nature, or perhaps there's a death of a young child, and we can see these also, we can use these examples as crisis within a family unit and try to make an understanding of why these things are happening. And that falls back to uh, a def one of the definitions of esoteric science, which is essentially cause and effect or learning and trying to understand and apprehend the spiritual causes that lead to physical plane manifestation or physical plane effects. And that is a definite divine law, cause and effect, that uh, once we understand more so how that plays out and uh, how that law manifests here physically, then we can uh, proceed with some more understanding and not be so bewildered about certain situations. Now, it's very difficult to paint the complete picture, let's say, in the instance of a young child uh, that uh, is born uh, with uh, some, like, autistic, for instance, born into a family autistic, to really look at, you know, is this child uh, having to suffer for some previous thing that he's done, or are the parents, perhaps, needing this experience? And so are they having to have a crisis as two, as a couple coming together to have to solve these problems and perhaps they were very selfish individuals and then coming together to have to raise in the proper fashion an autistic child all the special attention and extra care and need that that child would uh, have to have to grow and have have a more level playing field with with uh, with the rest of the children and so taking that in consideration uh, this may be a crisis example for two parents again as I was saying earlier to have to put aside their own selves for a little while their own selfish tendencies to do something for the greater good of this this baby that's autistic in this example that I'm, I'm trying to put together here and then certainly uh, <clears throat> as far as there there are many family crises that we can consider and that uh, are going to, again, cause disruption within a unit. And that's the whole, the whole uh, crux of the matter as well, is that there's this opposition. If there's stability and evenness and equilibrium and balance, and there's a state of non-growth, 
then something's going to have to happen within that system to disrupt unrest, cause unrest, and cause upheaval so that there can be further growth. And that's how, how evolution continually plays out. Once evolution has done its work and that process, that manifestation has reached its maturity and is no longer adequate, and it's time for it to subside and make way for something new, we see that disruption taking place. And that can take place in the individual's life. For instance, with a child, again, we, des we describe the birth, and then uh, age seven is the next major crisis for the child, age 14, and that's kind of around the time that the, the permanent teeth come in, age 14, when um, the puberty starts to set in, and then age 21, when there's relative adult stage has been reached. There's, and it falls in that instance with the human with cycles of seven. And we can look at a lot of different cycles that factor in and that have to be considered as well in this considering of cause and effect. But essentially, finding within the individuals these points of crisis and these cyclic uh, circumstances that factor in, we can get a better understanding, gain a better understanding, and proceed with some illumination from this, uh, this science and the study of, of how these things work and, and, and uh, the laws that uh, affect manifestation. And so again, when there is something that's uh, still and stagnant and no longer useful, there has to be that crisis that has to disrupt the system to make way for something new. And we find that within the human system, if there is a disease, for instance, we find diseasing, disease cropping up in the system that's, that's usually an indicator, <clears throat> excuse me, that's usually an indicator, again, at some point of crisis, of trying to find expression. And in many, many instances, at some level, it's going to be, again, this duality, this relation of spirit to matter. And as we start to make more uh, of an approach towards our soul and try to basically align ourselves with the... Uh, with the whims of our, of our very soul and align ourselves in that fashion, then that causes a disruption because we're trying to impose a whole new rhythm. We're trying to bring into the physical manifestation something that is a part of our, well, it's connected to our physical nature, but is, has its own qualities. And so there's this merging would most certainly cause disruption. And you find this in the, in the lives of those people that try to make some kind of approach to divinity. They find in their lives that they, the material life is no longer the, doing them justice and suiting their needs and they grow weary of material things and, and things that money can achieve and accomplish and even uh, relationships with other individuals and things of that nature. After a certain point in time, you'll find uh, this recurring pattern in, in the lives of individuals that they reach a point where they no longer have that much of a desire for material plain things. And so there's a reorientation. There's a dramatic shift, a great change, and a great rearranging motion that takes place. And there's this great shifting, again, from, from uh, matter to spirit or, or vice versa in, in any case. And we can look at it as two plates, maybe the tectonic plates rubbing against each other. There's a lot of energy and a lot of motion building and grinding and the intense pressure that is built up by this shift, this reorientation. It causes great disruption and great turmoil within the human system. And the, we ever uh, can follow the examples and read the stories and, and, and see historical examples of people that have taken this course. And they find adversity, they find difficulties. And there's also a term that factors in that's called the dark night of the soul. And that very much ties into points of utter despair that certain individuals reach when they're trying to uh, make some kind of a path of return to divinity and they no longer have appeal for material things. Again, they, they have a dark night of the soul because they seem to be caught in limbo between two states, two conditions. The material world is not really appealing to them and the spiritual world has not fulfilled itself and, and manifest itself fully to their understanding and so they're yearning and trying to reach and achieve for something spiritual but the material tendencies of lifetimes those tendencies have built up and set up a rhythm that has to be overcome and so there's great disruption in those instances conversely when an individual has some sort of a soul yearning and they do nothing about it or they ignore it they they accentuate the material nature that also has its own disruptive crisis that it creates and so by virtue of ignoring the soul tendency the soul nature or the impulse of the soul 
and that tugging, that gentle tugging that our very soul in some cases offers, intuitive flashes, um, moments of joy and bliss that just spontaneously well up in our hearts that we just can't explain or maybe certain things uh, do set us off and something really moves us to that point and we have that welling forth of emotion and, and joy and, and pure, pure love. These gl brief glimpses are the soul coming through trying to set up some kind of uh, a relationship and it has to be a two-way street. The soul exists largely unaware of what the material person is doing in his, in his daily activities. It's not until that person reorients himself mentally and makes the conscious decision and changes one's mind to motivate oneself and to have the, the intent to accentuate spirit. And, and those disruptions will, will start to set in. But if that is ignored, if these little hints and glimpses and, and uh, little subtle reminders are ignored, then we see that, that disruption coming in because the relationship is not being allowed and this, there, this energy has to expend itself in some way and so it usually finds its way into some sort of anxiety, nervous energy, depression. Um, those are the main things and then ultimately it can lead to disease. And so once, once a person has this set of cleavages set up as far as this opposition in, in one's thinking or in one's emotional nature, then there has to be some sort of a resolution. If there isn't the resolution and these, this opposition continues to where spirit and matter are constantly in opposition and no point of equilibrium or rest or, or balance is struck, then ultimately it can lead again, as I said, to anxiety, nervous disorder, uh, stress for, for sure, at the very least, just agitation in general that will ultimately manifest into physical agitation and likely at some point some physical disease. We all carry the genetic code for certain diseases. We're all predisposed through genetic uh, family ties and things of that nature. Nations have genetic predispositions and uh, we carry those with us, but if they, uh, they don't have to come into full-fledged manifestation, the, 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 the disease does not have to come out and uh, be a full-blown disease. It can stay latent and the seeds for it can just stay tucked away without, again, growing into some disease. It has to do with um, us finding this state of balance. And uh, ultimately, uh, one of the main things is again, I've, I've mentioned previous, on previous shows, eliminating stress is a certain, certainly a key component to that. But when some stay within that, that flux and that agitation between spirit and matter and the soul nature and the physical nature are constantly kind of just jockeying for position, but over, overall, the mentality and the emotional nature centered, centered in the, the dense nature of the body, the lower centers, then that's going to cause, again, a chance for disease, definitely disruption, definitely a chance for anxiety and all of these these disruptions that stay and they aren't resolved. And so it, it's really incumbent upon individuals uh, at some point uh, to, if they want to get past that sort of condition, to have some intelligent application to the problem at hand. And that is to first identify what it is. Now, I'm going to use another example. If our emotional desire nature is such that we feel we have to be with someone, uh, have another, have a spouse, or have a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever the case may be, that we always feel we need to be with somebody, and if we don't have somebody with us, then we're feeling incomplete, not whole, you know, we feel lost, whatever, lonely, and uh, we feel we need somebody in our lives to prop us up and to, to strengthen us. And I feel like that really is a, that's the way of looking at that can be um, very limiting because if we realize through, through esoteric science and understanding divine law and things of that nature, we all are connected in, in uh, we're all uh, interconnected to such an inextricable degree that we all are part of one living entity. And so if we really keep that in consideration, at its highest levels, then we really can never truly be alone because we're always connected at all times to all activity, to all other people, all other animals, God, what we would term evil, all those things are what we are connected to at all times. And so we really are never alone, you know, whether there are demons or angels plaguing us or not, whatever the case may be. 
uh, we truly aren't alone. And so that is a misconception, I think, to feel that we have to be with somebody. But again, to follow this example through, this emotional desire nature, the person's astral nature, if you want to use that term, is going to constantly be dominating because that desire is going to take such a high place of prominence within the person's life that that's going to dictate and dominate all their expression. When they're driving to work, they're going to be looking for other people in other cars. When they're at the workplace, they're going to be considering other, per, perhaps other employees, people that they talk to on the phone, people that they encounter as potential uh, spouses or whatever. And then they're always going to be on the take constantly trying to find this person that's going to suit their what they feel is some big hole that they want to fill inside themselves. And so that until that's somehow satiated or satisfied or there's a balance made and struck, then that's going, there's always going to be that wrangling. There's always going to be that between soul and, and, and matter or between spirit and matter. There's always going to be that opposition and then uh, disruption and unease. And so it's going to constantly plague that person. And these are the kind of things that also, as I said earlier, are going to allow for anxiety, nervousness, uh, self-esteem issues, depression, all these things to creep in if we can't really understand and identify the problem. And in this instance, it would be to understand that, yes, we are all connected to all things and that we don't have to be with somebody in that traditional sense as far as taking a, a wife or a husband or what have you uh, to be complete and whole. And we can have very fulfilling, very satisfying relationships that don't have to be that sort of, uh, have that permanency and have that, uh, that uh, well, that link is, uh, is that uh, some may perceive they need. And so that's one way to consider that as well, as far as uh, our wish life, what we wish for and what we hope and desire that may keep us caught like a rat on a little cage, you know, uh, that's on the wheel, that just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning, trying to run after something that, like the carrot in front of their face that they never are really able to, to grab for whatever reason. And uh, some people choose to stay in that place and some people, uh, it, it's a life choice for them to stay locked in this disruption. And it's, in some instances, a life lesson that some individuals need to learn. And this ties into karma and reincarnation because these things that we have to learn and get past are going to revisit us time after time in recurring lives until we can work past these problems. And um, these things do recur and, and they'll find their way. Uh, ultimately, we'll find our way back to meet these same circumstances until we can resolve these things. And that also ties into relationships between individuals, <clears throat> uh, families, nations, and you know broader larger relationships that tie in as well that would c cause a certain individual to reincarnate maybe several times in America for instance or several times in Iraq for instance and I think we're going to see that more so too as these points of crisis worldwide are uh, exploited and the the light of uh, public opinion is played out more so and is, is shown on these situations and so we'll have to keep and also, too, technology, also technology has uh, really ramped up the acceleration that information is spread and what have you. And so points of crisis worldwide for nations, tribes, families, um, all at all levels are played out on a world scale quite quickly. And so we are aware oftentimes of other points of crisis. And so we are oftentimes very overwhelmed by so many points of crisis happening simultaneously and when we have things in our own lives that are overwhelming us I mean a point of crisis may be just trying to get to the daycare on time so you don't have to pay the late fees because you're trying to pick your kid up and get through the, get there in traffic before the, the time is up I mean it could be something as simple as that but we all have these little points of crisis and so it builds from our individual points of crisis again through the family community city on out from there and it, it, to take this a vast study and look at it from the most localized subjective levels and then branching out and seeing the vastness of points of crisis that is the study of esoteric science in one aspect of it seeing and determining this whole disruptive process on a global scale and seeing how everything is interlinked and intertie and tied together intertwined together to such a degree that we cannot neglect what's going on in other places around the globe because these points of crisis in the human family or in the animal kingdom, for instance, in certain 
you know, things, things, certain species becoming extinct, and that's part of divine law that's right and proper in some cases, uh, that some things pass out of existence and no longer, the form is no longer adequate to meet the spiritual demands. But nonetheless, we find these crises, crises collectively coming together, and again, it can prove to be somewhat overwhelming for people when they're just trying to just get their own game together in their own life and just trying to make ends meet in their own situation or keep their family unit together. These are difficult challenges, and then when you factor in all these other bombardments and these other um, bits of information that we're exposed to constantly, it's difficult for us not to unconsciously take these other problems into our thinking apparatus, into our emotional understanding, and to have them mill around in that, in that working process, that mechanic pro mechanical process that works between our thinking and our feeling and those two how they're tied together so we're constantly being bombarded by things that affect us emotionally things that affect us mentally and these points of crisis build and build and the tension that is reached either causes again some sort of disruption some sort of disease agitation anxiety nervous disorder or there's ultimately an imposing of a higher rhythm and a new equilibrium is reached again once there's a certain point of equilibrium that is too stagnant and there needs to be change, circumstances come into effect and there is spiritual energy that comes into effect that makes these changes and that motivates individuals and organizations and the political, economic, all of these factors. We find the leading individuals getting caught up in a fever pitch when something new needs to come onto the scene, needs to be born. And we can look at those uh, big examples, like for instance, the birth of communism and the birth of a communist uh, agenda for our nation, like China, for instance, becoming communist, uh, certainly Russia. We look at the imposition of these systems. We can look at this whole crisis, this point of crisis that's basically, uh, it's a ratio between soul and matter, or spirit and matter, that causes these disruptions. And so when the people of a nation need some sort of test or trial, they find themselves in a country like Russia or a country like Iraq currently, Afghanistan, for instance, uh, Somalia, any, any country in Af Africa practically that you name, Ireland. Uh, individuals find themselves in these crisis situations be for many reasons, because it's a karmic thing. In many instances, the people that need to be there to resolve and create some balance or equilibrium are born into these areas to bring and restore some normalcy and bring in a new rhythm that's right and proper at the time. And um, we see, again, in individuals coming into incarnation uh, to carry out the destinies of nations. And certainly we can look at the political we can look at the documentation, if you want to look at it from that angle, as far as, okay, well, yes, you can say maybe there's a spiritual impulse, but look, here, this guy funded these guys, you know, if you look at the, at uh, Prescott Bush, you know, being implicated as a trading with the enemy during the Second World War, um, things of that nature, and we can see the, the uh, bankrolling of these great changes, these great experiments in governmental and when I say great, I don't necessarily mean good. I mean great as far as broad, vast. But we see these world-scale uh, experiments taking place that certainly we can point to, you know, follow the money. We can say, oh, this guy paid for this and this guy paid for that. But to look at it esoterically, we have to understand the impulse that led these individuals to align themselves with these various organizations and institutions that put them in positions of power to play out certain key issues and, and uh, circumstances on a global scale. And so we can see how the certain individuals came together to form World War II's outcome. Well, uh, it's uh, coming together and its ultimate outcome, I should say. And we can trace spiritually the cause that led to that effect from many angles. And it's a vast study. And also, too, with, uh, also with Iraq, in the sense of what's going on there, and the whole Middle East right now, for that matter. I'm not trying to get off as far as this being, you know, as far as there being Bible prophecy and things of that nature. Um, I think that's a little, some of that has to be taken with a grain of salt as far as how these things are interpreted. If the Bible is being interpreted literally, especially Revelation, 
some caution needs to be considered because unless one has an understanding of the so-called Kabbalah and Kabbalistic symbolism, then any interpretation of any Judeo-Christian document is going to, to suffer without that understanding because there's much symbolism that has to be accounted for when we look at these prophetic or symbolic documents, especially a, a, a religious nature. And so these things we can see and point to as maybe looking like they're panning out, but that also is part of certain individuals trying to make it seem as if these are an end times, that things are to that fever pitch as far as crisis. And so we're constantly being given uh, different crises, crises to, uh, to go up against. And we're being bombarded again at all turns by different levels and different degrees of crisis. And one example would be earlier today, I was watching uh, some college football, and they normally have uh, where they'll display, it's kind of like a, a CG graphic sort of thing, computer generated, ready, generated graphic, where they'll show the, the white, uh, the yellow line rather, the first down line. And lately they've been showing advertisements for different corporations. Well, today they were showing the new color of money, and they propped up in their little CG graphic right on the field of the new $20 bill. And I was quite appalled by that. I just, it's very, uh, I don't know, mixed reactions about that for certain. Also, there were commercial advertisements for this new $20 bill showing that the color of money is going to change. And they were, at the very bottom, you saw the logo for the Federal Reserve. I mean, it's interesting and intriguing to me that in this day and age, the Federal Reserve is advertising. And that also lends a lot of credence to the fact, the firmly established fact, that the Federal Reserve is a for-private corporation. It's not a public, you know, it's not a, it's not a public, uh, it's not public, it's a, it's a private institution. It's quasi-public in some sense, but really the, it has private shareholders at the highest levels. And so they need to advertise, I guess, at some point in time, and that's what they're doing. And to me, it's just really intriguing. And it's just another point of crisis that can be potentially played out as far as monetary manipulation that we've seen since the Fed's inception. And uh, it's, this is a recurring thing that we'll see, I'm sure, as well. <clears throat> now, again, con considering um, when we think of points of crisis, uh, certainly there are these points of crisis that do carry the weight of humanitarian. When we hear of a humanitarian crisis, these things are going to be a little bit vaster in scale, a little larger in scale than, your again, your small individual personality crisis or your local crisis. And uh, that is becoming more so the thinking that there is cri a crisis of humanity and not just one but many crises of humanity and that we're collectively challenged by maybe uh, some kind of a earthquake, for instance, or certainly different socioeconomic things, uh, weather-related disasters, crop disasters, famine, plagues, all these things that are often deemed humanitarian crises. And we see this being more so in the mainstream, that we're going to consider things more on a global scale, and that's part and parcel of what's its in our nature. It's in our intuitive nature to want to look at our fellow man as our brother. And that's part of this unfolding of this global system that is a spiritual impulse, and that's why we see so much disruption right now. There is a mass spiritual impulse that's awakening in so many, many billions, ultimately, of people to varying degrees that is causing part of this upheaval to take place and it's causing this disruption, it's causing the Middle East crisis to really be accentuated at this point in time, uh, things with Israel that is causing people to point to Bible prophecy and all these things are playing out as soul is trying to find its way into some material expression and it's happening on a world scale and so that's why we're seeing that we're reaping the rewards but also reaping this upheaval as well. I mean, we have to get past all of this shakeup before we get to something that's going to be any sort of semblance of a level playing field where goodwill and right human relations can, at some point, lead us closer to peace. We can't just impose peace and have peace treaties without there being honest goodwill and right human relations from the two opposing uh, factions or multiple factions. There has to be some coming together and some agreeing. And that has to also and tie in with these points of crisis. We have to identify the crisis. And when you have religious differences, when you have 
governmental differences. When you have two camps basically saying, I'm right, and the other camp saying, I'm right, then you have definitely difficult, a lot of difficult, um, well, there's a lot of opposition, so you're going to have great difficulty in smoothing over the opposition and trying to find common points. And, uh, you know, certainly we see that more so with nations coming together, trying to form accords, pacts, tr pacts treaties, and all these different amalgamations that have been, in many instances, prostituted to the ends of a few, those that wish to enslave us, to try to create this global system of enslavement rather than a global system of enlightenment that we really have a real opportunity for. It's, it's just a matter of how we're going to allow these things to play out, ultimately. We all have our individual free will, and we can make choices, and we can make group choices, and we can make collective choices that will allow, again, for the spiritual unfolding of this concept to take place. A new world order, so-called, has always been a spiritual concept, and it's been around ever since man has been around, and these embryonic concepts started to come into the hearts and minds of men. And they started to want to, those idealistic individuals started to look at themselves as part of a one human family, and they wanted to demonstrate that we are all part of one human family to the, to the remainders of the race. And so we see, again, these different individuals that have brought this information out over time. And then we also see other individuals that have taken this concept and seen how if, we're try if you're a small minor minority trying to control the masses through bloodlines and through keeping control over various systems for thousands of years, you're going to find a real threat in a new world order concept that is really essentially a level playing field where everybody worldwide gets some semblance of a fair shake and everybody gets some kind of equal opportunity for the things that we deem essential in life, water, shelter, employment opportunity, educational opportunity, opportunity to raise a family, opportunity just to be safe and secure in your own area. All these things that are the most basic rights that we hold with the highest esteem. Uh, for that to really take place on a global scale, the plans of those that are trying to make a new world order, just a small, uh, the small cabal that's trying to make it just for them exclusively at the cost of many lives, at the cost of much waste of energy, much misuse of energy, misspent energy, misdirection of energy that's being manipulated by many ways that we can see the plans. Again, and this ties into esoteric science as well. Once we intuitively understand more so divine law and our place within the larger picture, we can see how we can act not only locally uh, in, in a family environment, work environment, city environment, as we did with the resolution for the Patriot Act. And so many folks got together on it. Again, I have to commend people again for that culmination of effort. And that can happen on a lot of different fronts if we can just keep that in mind. It has to do with our getting our hearts and our heads together on the same page for equal opportunity for folks and uh, th that keeping in, in to keep taking consideration points of crisis and how collectively we move from point of crisis to point of crisis and from revelation to revelation and so we'll continue we'll continue this unfolding process this is the evolutionary process that uh, we're here for this learning that we're here for to unfold these capacities that are latent in us and so it's our human nature, it's our soul nature to want to bring forth this expression. And it's also the in inherent choice and nature of uh, these certain minority to deny the vast numbers this opportunity. So this is going to play out, but ultimately the vast numbers are going to win in the end. I'm very confident of this, and I see evidence of this all the time, that as uh, more soul urging and the soul impulse is more prevalent and prominent in the hearts and minds of men that you'll see more things being exposed. You'll see so many more things being exposed like this bug that popped up that the FBI supposedly placed in the mayor of Philadelphia's office, uh, the CIA leak, um, Dr. David Kelly in the UK supposedly committed suicide, you know, on and on and on. We're going to see more and more and more of this unfolding coming about. It's, it's, it's right on the horizon and, and just look for Things to be quite shocking, actually, as far as things you would have never, ever perceived to see the light of day that are going to find their way into full illumination, and we're going to have real understanding about a lot of issues upcoming in the near future. So I would caution all of us, or everyone that's interested in, in 
that line of thought, to think along those lines and see if you can't see a lot of these things that are coming out uh, that were staying hidden. Maybe they weren't so good, maybe whatever the case may be, that they're finding, they're finding their way out for whatever reason. So uh, let me go ahead and grab a couple of calls and see what's going on. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Corey, this here's Moses. I'm hey, Mo, what's up? How are you? Good to see you back. Thanks. I uh, just want to say that everyone involved in tyranny should might as well just go ahead and make an extra effort just to be nice because it's, it's all going to come back to them anyway. However, here's a... Uh, little 30 second song clip okay. that was going to bring a smile to your face. I restricted myself to two bass lines, one drum beat, didn't know what the song was going to be about, uh -huh. but uh, here's just a little snippet here, and this is the disco version. Of course, there will be a country fried and rock and roll version, All right, great. but uh, here we go. In about 30 seconds, give me the thumbs up that you can uh, hear it coming in okay. All righty. the words and everything yeah uh, when you clear. die you're, you're uh, every time i, I die i come back to life right exactly sometimes i'm a husband sometimes i'm a wife right i did hear that part and as I well say, uh, i want to see people having fun plenty of food for everyone a uh, safe place to live and call their home with no fear of war because that's not what we're for right that's a great sentiment. I appreciate you being creative in that respect. You know what I mean? This is, that's the kind of message I like people to hear, and that's great. Cool. Kind of a little maybe Depeche Mode going on there. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's the Euro Disco on purpose, but, you know, just, just for <laughs> Well, I really appreciate that, though. Thanks a lot. You bet. Talk to you later. Take care. Have a good evening. All right, caller, you on the air? Yeah, guy, Matt, that last guy who just called. Yeah. I mean, that song was kind of... Uh, I don't know if it was demonic or something like that, but every time I die, it's something like that, reborn again. You well, know. he's talking about reincarnation. Yeah, reincarnation. Did you understand that? Yeah, basically. Oh, okay. It was yeah. pretty different. But, uh, you different. know, um, I, yeah, I wanted to ask you, you know, do you think um, President Bush is going to be the next president? That's a really good question. And, you know, I have to admit, I was looking in California a number of years ago, briefly, and I remember when Ann Richards... Uh, lost the gubernatorial to George Bush. Yeah. And I saw right at that point, I was telling people in Cali, hey, here's your next president right here. So when all that hubbub was going on with the Al Gore, the hanging chads and all that, they had already securely had their boy lined up, which is George W. Bush. And uh, I'm kind of torn between thinking he's going to be a one-term president like his father that just comes in and just wrecks stuff yeah. within four years, turns things upside down, and then somebody else comes in that's going to, to be in some people's minds, a savior, like another Democrat. They'll say, oh, now we've got the Democrats back. Now we can really fix things. And they'll just take the ball and run further with it, you know, just like from uh, the father to Clinton to Junior, you know, that's So do that's you think serious. the, um, you know, like, <clears throat> as far as the economy, do mm -hmm. you think it's picking up? Do what about the economy mean, picking up? I mean, do you think, like, there, there are a lot more jobs out there, the employment? Well, I think that'll gradually turn around. There, no thing ha is all cycles have to have an up and down. You know what I mean? And there's certainly manipulation going on behind the scenes to create a lot of this it's job stuff. It's kind of right. picking up a little bit. I mean, you know. Well, it depends on what jobs you're looking for as well. If you're looking for a quality job, yeah, you're right. going to have difficulty still because quality jobs are skating on out of our country. You know, mm -hmm. and they're still allowing. It's, this is a double-edged sword thing, too. Allowing immigrants to come in, like, for instance, if you're from India, and you can come in to work on a visa. 
and you work for some high tech company. Well, now they've got it to where they're not, they're not even really importing the high tech jobs. They're allowing the companies to be formed in India or China right. or what have you. And so you've got foreign, and just like um, Ford, Ford just created 5,000 new jobs in Mexico. <laughs> you want to <Yeah>. move? <laughs> But that's you know? a lot cheaper labor, too, though. So, that's I mean, they save money, you know, it kind of works hand-in-hand, hand, you know. When you There's a lot of going on, manipulating behind the scenes, and uh, it's going to go back and forth until they decide they want to probably pull the rug. What, about, what, do you think, what, what do you think about the new building downtown that they built with the shiny glass roof? How does it look in the skyline? I think it fits all right. That's an interesting yeah. question. I think it fits. They, they, they plan things like that. They want all cities, all cities because think about it, there are like Masonic people and people like that that they want things to have a certain symmetry. All skylines, they have to petition when they put up a new building because if somebody says, oh, that's going to look ugly, that doesn't look right with this skyline and this cityscape, we ain't yeah. going to have it. And so they go through a lot of trouble supposedly to make certain buildings, you know, and put them in a certain it, it location. It looks nice, though, um, basically. It seems to fit in pretty good as far as I can tell as well. It, it refreshing the skyline yeah. in Austin. You yeah, know? I like it. Yeah, so that's all I really wanted to say. And all my right. name is Joseph, okay. by the way. All right, I, appreciate your call. Thanks a lot. A lot of good points you brought up. Have a nice evening. Hello, caller, you on the air? Hello. Hey, how's it going? This is Kevin. Hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about the crisis of the world, and all the peace that's not being held down. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot more pieces of ass going around. and <laughs> You want to spread the love, huh? <laughs> There's certainly something to be said for all that good stuff as well. I mean, that's how a lot of things get breaking down, broken down over time when you find intermarriage through different racial groups, ethnic groups, and what have you. And people, people can loosen up a lot when it comes to things like that. So that's not a bad thing. Hello, Corey, you on the air? Corey? Hey, how's it going? Corey? Yeah. Back, back. Hey, buddy, you know what's up, neighbor. Hey, man, I thought I heard an imposter, an, impo an FBU imposter claiming uh, to be the one and only FBU guy that uh, Pokey was going to allow some airtime on a Trailer Park show to. It didn't quite sound like the original FBU guy. I don't know. Call me crazy, but uh, maybe my ear was full of me. But if uh, the real deal, you, want to come on to the tra Trailer Park show, I think that would be cool. I, I would uh, commend you for pulling that off. So I would consider it if I were you. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, caller, you on the air? Hi. How are can you? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, can you tell me the difference between karmic debt and, say, being tested for divine help in the universe? You know, that's that a very saying? good question. And I okay, think, I'm going to hang up while you answer. Okay, sure. I, that's a great question. And I think it's all going to depend on certain situations because... A lot of times it seems as if when there's a karmic situation for, let's say, a family to have to encounter or what have you, it's more of a group situation. Whereas karmic ties, karmic debt, is always individual. Mm, I, it's hard to say always because there are, there are little, there are exceptions. I know that's a bit difficult to really get into, but for the most part, individual karma is for personalities and individuals. Family things, nationwide and all that, when you start to factor in more people, you're having more of a group situation going on, and that's more so for lesson learning, I feel. Now certainly, a person can be born, let's say, with like um, missing a limb or something, and that's, that would be both a challenge for the parents to raise this dis disabled kid, and a very much a challenge for the individual to get past that uh, missing a limb. So there's, it's a blend, and it's, you'd really have to look at individuals, I think, within a family unit and look at the vaster picture, and then you could paint or portray specifically to, to each individual circumstances. Uh, there's a lot of things that are universal about these laws, but there are things that are specific to uh, circumstances and situations that may allow for some, I don't know, a little bit of flexibility, if you will. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Hey, Corey. It's uh, the co-founder here of FBU. Or the one I recognize. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so was that you calling? Uh, that was no imposter. That was indeed I. Okay, so hey, give me the scoop. Are you going to try to be on the show? That is a great possibility. That. Uh, so what are you going to do? Wear like a wrestling mask or something? Well, we will see because, you see, Corey, there yeah. are certain specific advisable times to make your presence established and sure. known and establish your identity mm -hmm. when you belong to a an organization of this type right which is beneficial to our society these days and uh, 
I could make an appearance on the trailer park show mm -hmm. with Mr. Pokey, mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, first I, I wanted to call you and uh, let you know that I am watching and I found out about your, your new series on your new uh, channel here. Uh, it's going to be the same time, same right. time, uh, same night, just on a different channel. But right. uh, yeah, that could very well happen. Uh, I'm going to have to organize that with Mr. Pokey and uh, have to uh, go over this with my co-founder in FBU, which is Mr. Mojo, who I'm sure you've heard call many access shows for going on between somewhere between five and eight years. And uh, so that way we can go on the trailer park show and uh, further our message of, uh, and you know, the, uh, the meaning of the crushing of faggotry once and for all. Well, see, I so, think that would be much more advisable because you'll give individuals an opportunity, you know. And I will take calls. Wonderful. <laughs> I think that's a, it's high time, my man. It's Pros and cons. But, uh, yeah, uh, I'm glad to see that you didn't change your, your time and, and you're branching out. To uh, further, so you're, you're saying that Channel 16 reaches up into Williamson County, yet 10 does not. Cedar Park is tra is technically Travis County still. Cedar, oh, okay, but Cedar Park doesn't get 10. They just well, they switched it over. They were getting 10. They switched it over to be Cedar Park local television. I see. They have their own television. cable. Something like that, yeah. I see. Okay. And so I wanted to accommodate those folks. There's about 40 some odd thousand people in that area that I want. Oh, well, to. that's great. Well, maybe they haven't yet been exposed to the message of FBU as well as uh, the Austin community and uh, Hayes <laughs> counties and surrounding counties. I'll let you give it one good run, brother. I'm going to have to let you go. But okay, Cor, I'll let you get on to other callers. Right. Uh, it's uh, been fun as usual, and you know how we say it. Fag bashers unite! Fag bashers unite! Fag bashers unite! Fag that's how they say it. All right, then. So people that haven't heard that in other parts of, of Travis County, welcome to Access Television. <laughs> Hello, caller. You're on the air. How's it going, Corey? Good. Yourself? Uh, I had a question for you. Sure. I'm doing all right. Um, if, if one loses, like, touch with its, with uh, Earth's natural energy and its rhythm and their spirit, uh, is, what is, like, the best way to go about getting that back, you know? through any type of methods or prayers? Or well, sure, prayer and, and things of that nature and contemplation are really important, but the very first key thing is to identify for you what is this thing that's causing me to have like a blockage or stoppage that's not allowing this free flow to go through for whatever what I, reason. What I think it is is what you were talking about earlier, the crutch kind of thing with, with uh, relationships and other individuals. Right. Yeah. That can definitely factor in. You have to you have to honestly assess yourself. You have to really look at yourself in an open way and then make those honest decisions and choices as to what it is that you need to do to make yourself, you know, more open to a more spiritual yeah. leaning or what have you. Well, thanks, thanks a lot. You got any good remedies for quitting smoking? How's that? Remedies for quitting smoking? Uh, I don't know. I've heard there's some kind of herbal thing, but you never know. There's, there's cures or a dime a dozen. But that's one thing, too. I mean, those kind of you know, smoking or drinking or things of those na of that nature as well. Certainly, that can c get you in locked in to something that's not good and can keep you ritualizing. You know what I mean? That's a bad thing too when you get locked into a certain pattern of behavior, and uh, you, you're not doing anything to get out of it. You'll you'll stay locked in until you can recognize it for what it is and then move out. So that's another key thing to consider as well. Hello, caller, you on the air? Hello. Hey, how's it going? Yes, sir. Um, I've never seen you before, but I did hear what you were saying. I mean. Was, are you like anti-gay or what? Uh, I'm not personally. I I say live and let live. But there are certain callers and certain organizations in Austin, Travis County, that are very much against homosexual individuals. Right. But more so, they're against. Uh, according to what they tell me, they're against like uh, pedophilia and a lot of the that exactly. kind of thing. Well, let me ask you something. Sure. I mean, you know, for me, I mean, I'm gonna go ahead and spill my beans on on Oxus Channel. But um, you know. I mean, is homosexuality a sin? It's all relative as to how you look at it. The example I fall back on, as far as a nat natural example, is that if you look at a magnet, it has a positive end, it has a negative end. Right. If you put the positive end to the positive end of another magnet, they push each other away, they repel. If you right. put the positive end to the negative end, they attract. Okay. You know, the opposites attract, and that's the reason why you have a man and a woman to make a baby you know, two men can't make a baby, two women can't make a baby. Right. Although they can be adequate parents, I don't disagree with that. Well, let me ask you something. Sure. Um, if you see two women, mm -hmm. it's considered beautiful. 
the two men. In managers. some people's opinions, not everyone. Yeah, well, well the majority. A lot of people. To an extent. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, uh, you know, two men is, is considered repulsive. A lot of times, true, yes. Right. I mean, it, why is it okay for two women to say, you look beautiful, or your hair looks nice today? I really, I, like, I've questioned that myself, and I really have not come to a full answer about that. I think it's just overall society has certain opinions, you know, they have morals that they feel they still need to hold on to, and that's one of the main ones, I guess, is that when they see two men, I mean, certain societies in, in the past were more open to it, you know, it comes and goes throughout time as far as being popular or accepted right. and being shunned. And so in this day and age, it's, these things are coming out in the open more so because they have to be dealt with. We can't, pe these things won't stay in the closet forever. They have to come out so people can acknowledge them. Right. That's what's going on right now. People are trying to acknowledge, you know, who, more aspects of other people and trying to be more open and allowing towards other people. You that's know, true. even the guy that's the basher, he's still in his own way trying to be understanding of something that he is not himself really down with. You know, but he's still trying to reach out to in his own way for a fuller understanding. I feel. Okay? Well, let me ask you something uh, Go ahead. real quick. Um, if I mean, I mean to to hear somebody say, you know, faggot, faggot, whatever, you know, to me that, you know, I mean that that that's not right in my in my agenda, you know. But when I, I, can I appreciate mean, that they're straight and there's homosexual, and I think a lot of men fall in the middle, but they're they're scared to accept that. Anything's possible, my friend. I'm going to let you go on that note, but I would say this, that that can also be perhaps, um, you know, their own limitation. If for some reason you just have some fear of another group of individuals, whether that be, you know, eth along ethnic lines or whatever, uh, different things, you know, there's, that's your own uh, challenge to overcome or to not, you know, so it's an individual thing. Let me try to grab one last call. Hello, caller, you on the air? Fact this is tonight! Okay. Hello, caller, you on the air? Uh, Corey? Yeah, how's it going? Yeah, I think that most people who are um, anti-homosexual just have these, they're afraid of the strange feelings they have themselves inside. But the reason I was calling is um, I was curious as to what you thought about the uh, uh, crisis in Alabama with the Ten Commandments and the, uh, the state uh, capital. There. Hmm, that's a good one. I'll let you go on that. No, I not much time. Uh, really, that's being more played out as a divisive issue. Um, you know, everybody's going to argue, oh, well, they should allow everything under the sun then. And then you're going to have the argument, well, our country's based on Judeo-Christian morals, laws, precepts, values, what have you. And so that has historical implications in that instance. Um, it, when it's played out in a divisive manner in the public, in the media, to just divide people, that's the real crux of what's going on. That's the real meat of the matter here. They're trying to divide people by publicizing through the media, these events, just like the God in the Pledge of Allegiance, they really try to drum, the drum, beat the drums to that to cause dissension among the ranks. It's a key point of crisis. Problem, reaction, solution, thesis, antithesis, uh, synthesis. It's, it's the same thing. They try to manipulate individuals. It's a classic, classic ploy that's been used throughout time. But uh, we are running out of time. I want to remind folks, Jeff Contreras and therefore I am are uh, every Tuesday at. 10 on channel 16. We're here on uh, channel 16 Thursdays at 9. And I want to thank my producer Chris for commanding the helm of the Starship Esoterica. I'd like to thank everybody in Austin for taking the time to opportunity taking the opportunity to view. Have a nice evening.